So dear friends, uh, welcome to the new uh, Orb 2000 online uh, chat series. This is a new initiative that we have been undertaking in these uh, interesting and complicated times. Uh, we will be over the coming weeks and months interviewing uh, important and interesting people from the Form 2000 networks, discussing with them uh, current uh, events, important current issues, and looking how they affect democracy and freedom around the world. Uh, to start uh, our series, uh, I would like to uh, welcome a friend and uh, prominent Russian journalist and uh, analyst, Konstantin von Egert. We will discuss together how Russia is uh, reacting and, and perhaps, uh, perhaps using or even maybe abusing the, the current epidemic crisis and, and what uh, can we expect as we as we go on. So welcome, Konstantin, and let's go right in. So uh, thank you, Jakob, and thanks to Forum 2000 for the, for the invitation. Thank you for being with us. Uh, as uh, uh, you know, uh, in Russia, according to the official numbers, there is right now uh, somewhere over 5,000, at, at least as, 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 as of yesterday, somewhere uh, above 5,000 infected people. Uh, there is a couple of dozen uh, casualties, a couple of dozen victims. Uh, uh, the Kremlin initially seemed to be maybe under, underestimating the, the crisis. Uh, but right now, it seems that there is uh, a strict and, and even sophisticated measures, including uh, facial recognition technology and, and all that. Uh, and uh, it is interesting to see that in the context of what has been happening lately, including Putin's uh, attempt to change the constitution and then to perhaps prolong his presidential mandate until 2036. So, uh, Konstantin, uh, uh, I would be uh, I would be first interested to uh, to hear what is your assessment on how how Russia is doing in uh, combating the, the, the epidemic and uh, how would you compare this other countries? I think that Russia is doing for now um, fairly well in the sense that there, there, there are no uh, uh, instances of mass panic or mass failure of uh, hospitals or other medical establishments in providing treatment. But again, for 140 million country, uh, it's still probably quite an early stage. The uh, epidemic is most uh, visible in Moscow and a few other big cities. And um, one has to say that, uh, of course, one has to look at official figures, but uh, many people do not trust the official figures as they usually do not trust the government. So uh, one cannot say uh, what is the extent of the uh, epidemic right now uh, because there is suspicion that the government is probably keeping the numbers down. At the same time, I have to say, it's probably not keeping these numbers down uh, from, I don't know, many, many thousands to a few hundred or to a few thousand, because basically uh, Russia is not as close as China, for example, and things like that would have leaked out. So, so far, the government is managing, but it was late in closing the country. Uh, it was late in introducing quarantine, which is actually not called quarantine. Mr. Putin calls it extended holidays. Um, and uh, it was not very good at uh, basically uh, returning Russian citizens abroad uh, to Russia. Um, and again, there is another issue, of course, which is an issue for everyone. Uh, how long will the, will the Russian economy uh, be able to withstand this stoppage? And this is a very big issue. Uh, you see uh, economic commentators saying that uh, most of medium and uh, small businesses may go, go, go under in a matter of one month, two months. And this is a huge concern. I suspect that a lot of uh, Mr. Putin's procrastination, and there was evidently procrastination, he doesn't look very resolute in the face of COVID-19, uh, is 
uh, due to the fact that he is afraid uh, of economic and social consequences of uh, this epidemic, uh, and by extension, uh, of the consequences for his rule. And uh, this is, I think, what, uh, uh, what to a large extent informs his thinking or lack of thinking in such circumstances. One last thing in answer to your question. Uh, what we've seen uh, in the last days is that, or in the last couple of weeks, is that actually it is the Prime Minister Mikhail Mishustin and Moscow Mayor Sergei Subhanin who look uh, very much at the forefront of uh, fighting off the virus and who look as people taking really day-to-day -day decisions with regard to what happens rather than uh, uh, Vladimir Putin who still seems to be very much concerned with the big issues of global politics like his, um, uh, his very much current uh, price war with Saudi Arabia and, and uh, trying to range lifting the sanctions from the international community. Uh, so I think uh, there will be consequences uh, for Putin and for the ruling class in Russia after, after this epidemic uh, is over. So uh, do you think that there is any attempt on the part of the government at the moment to, to use the crisis in its benefit, to strengthen the control, to maybe push through the, the constitutional change or do anything uh, in, that, in that regard? Uh, there are two issues, two separate issues here. The issues of uh, Mr. Putin's uh, very personal and quite illegal constitutional amendments to make him a de facto uh, president for life uh, is something separate from what the government does now. The amendments uh, issue basically solved after the constitutional court obediently allowed Mr. Putin uh, uh, to stay on until 2036. Uh, the issue of this popular vote that was supposed to approve the amendments is very much on the back burner. I mean, yes, Putin wanted it as this kind of huge Russian democracy fest, quote unquote. Um, it's not going to happen in April, it's not going to happen in May, probably it's not going to happen until at, at best June. But in fact, in terms of Putin staying on, it is irrelevant. It's another matter, and you mentioned it in the introduction, what the government is trying to do, or rather the security state is trying to do, is to push uh, this a QR code facial recognition uh, network across the country, and especially in the big cities, um, in order to use, to monitor uh, people you know, quarantining themselves. Uh, that does exist. Uh, we'll see the extent to which it will be successful, but definitely quite significant parts of population are very suspicious of that, especially educated classes in the big cities. They think that Yes, it may be used for coronavirus, but then it will stay. And uh, uh, many people see it as a, a kind of backdoor attempt to use uh, the epidemic uh, as a way of introducing, of introducing Chinese-style total police state into Russia. Uh, I suppose that this is an issue that will be there, that will accompany the whole epidemic and which I hope will be fought back by civic society once the epidemic is over, once the pandemic um, basically uh, relaxes its grip on the world and on Russia. But yes, the government and the security service, let's face it, it's the FSB that's behind it, are trying to push it, uh, to push it through. Uh, coming back to uh, an issue that you mentioned also uh, earlier, uh, foreign politics. Uh, uh, we have, or foreign policy, we have uh, seen that uh, Russia has been quite active now delivering even maybe token, but, but still uh, aid uh, to Italy. We have seen a uh, uh, cargo of aid uh, arriving in, in New York. Uh, how do you see uh, Vladimir Putin and his, and his government using this, uh, uh, this crisis or coping with this crisis on the foreign policy field? Well, first of all, there is a propaganda uh, element to all that. And uh, here, Mr. Putin has taken a leaf out of the Chinese playbook, uh, trying to uh, put on a very brave face on, on this. 
uh, uh, on this crisis in which he is not looking the most important and definitely not the most resolute, resolute Russian politician. Uh, I suppose that it's a controversial decision because lots of people watching it on TV, uh, not all, but quite a lot of people watching it on TV are saying, well, <laughs> we, we do not have a, uh, an Italian style, um, European style uh, health service. Why are we sharing this with the Italians? Uh, I think that this aftertaste will linger among many people. And at the same time, what one sees, uh, one sees Putin grabbing this chance <laughs> and trying to push through this universal sanctions lifting through the United Nations, which ostensibly didn't work until now, but may work in some distant future or not so distant future. Um, another thing he's doing, he's continuing his price war with Saudi Arabia. So he's still obsessed with the United States, with the US um, energy sector, with US uh, uh, shale oil and shale gas production. Um, and uh, he's not making a necessary step back uh, to show that he's ready to accommodate uh, the Saudis. So he's, he's continuing to spat with Saudi Arabia. Um, also, what I think he's doing, uh, he is uh, trying to use uh, this crisis to find weak spots in uh, the, especially in Europe, and uh, push through more pro Kremlin policies um, under the slogan of, you know, cooperation, uh, fending off corona crisis, uh, coronavirus crisis, uh, and so COVID-19 crisis, and so on and so forth. So, yes, uh, Putin's foreign policy is still as it was before, um, although to some extent, of course, limited by domestic concerns. And there is an important addition here. Um, what one sees in these last couple of weeks is that all these major narratives of um, uh, constitutional amendments, of Ukraine, of uh, preparing for the 75th V-Day anniversary and fighting this propaganda war against the West, against Poland, you know, Putin talking to Pilsudski in his dreams and so on and so forth. All this was completely swept away by the, by, by the crisis. And I think even state propaganda uh, finds it more and more difficult to focus on Ukraine or, or, or the US or you know, all these kind of usual topics uh, because people are not interested. And that to a large extent, I think will have certain consequences for a wider segment of population uh, becoming, that is becoming increasingly disillusioned uh, with the government. So you are not seeing what, what we have been seeing, for example, in some, in some European countries that the the support for the government actually goes up uh, with the crisis. <laughs> we don't know what the support for the government is in the best of times. Uh, we won't know it now because uh, very, there are, there's only essentially one uh, pollster in Russia that can be believed, and this is Levada Center. Um, I think that we will not see a lot of improvement, probably not uh, hugely falling rates of trust in, in the government. Uh, and Putin personally, but I do not see any reasons for major improvement, at least at least for now. Um, I suppose that the that Putin's strategy is to actually keep himself away from the public eye, so as not to take responsibility if something bad happens, and then when things start to improve, to show up and say, "Well, you know, we fought back the virus," which maybe may work for him. But I think what we've seen in the last week and 10 days is that Putin's over-centralized system doesn't work efficiently because Putin had to essentially tell the governors of the regions with whom he's been keeping on very short leash to try and, you know, fend for yourselves. Do what you think is necessary without basically providing them with any funds. So he spent 16 years since 2004 building us up this super centralized system, hand-picking governors who are known for their loyalty, not for their professions, and suddenly telling them, by the way, you, you have to produce initiative, you have to be independent politicians. That is quite a shock for a lot of people inside the ruling class. 
And I think that this will have repercussions. What I personally think is that repercussions after the crisis will not be so much seen in the public opinion, although it will shift, but not dramatically, unless something really terrible happens, which I do not wish in Russia. But I think that inside the ruling class, this image of Putin isolating himself and being this kind of hands off it will have repercussions. I'm not saying we are, we are in the kind of the death of Stalin film scenario yet, uh, but I think that we are, are very close or much closer to rearrangement inside the regime because this centralization didn't work. Putin has shown himself to be not a strong and resolute leader that people thought he will be. So I suppose that a lot of younger people inside the Kremlin walls, metaphorical Kremlin walls, might well think, well, we are no worse than the president. And uh, if he's staying until 2036, we may not have a crack at the top jobs that we would like to have. I think that quite a lot of people will have these thoughts what kind of political consequences these thoughts will have? Well, I'm not yet ready to talk about that, but I'm sure these thoughts are already there. Okay. Um, if you had a, uh, if you were about to uh, have a, have a, 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 maybe a guess or a, an educated estimate of what will be, what will be the consequences of the crisis for Russia, politically, economically, socially, uh, once it sort of seats, uh, what would be your what would be your expectations? Let us imagine that Russia will not have uh, a, an Italian scale epidemic, because uh, in relative numbers it will be many, 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 many dead. I hope it won't happen. Now let us say Russia somehow muddles through and the epidemic peters out in one month, two months, three months, by the end of summer. The main consequence will be not so much the uh, inability of the medical system to cope with it. I think that there is still a residue of this kind of military style medical mobilization, which will probably help Russia to muddle through, with huge difficulties, muddle through medically. But the economic and social consequences are already there and they are not going to be better. Lots of people are going to lose their jobs. Lots of uh, medium, small, especially medium and small uh, enterprises are going to be bankrupt. There's going to be an increase in joblessness. And while, for example, Moscow is a very rich city, a country in itself, I would say, can manage it for some time, many other uh, even fairly well-off uh, cities won't be able to do that. That will, uh, that will increase demands on the government to act, deplete the resources, uh, make people angry. Also, it will, such crises always push lots of unstable people, psychologically unstable people, towards extreme action. So this may have consequences too. We already have instances of people, you know, rushing uh, guards in the supermarket in order to steal food. Not many, but there are. Another issue is millions of guest workers, migrants from Central Asia that are stranded in Russia without official access to healthcare and very little money. Uh, this is also a big, big, big question if you look towards you know, the perspective of one, two, three months. Russia will emerge out of this crisis poorer with, with uh, rearranged social ties. People are going to get together and fight things off without the government. Um, it will be less centralized after that because I'm sure that regional leaders will emerge that will be seen as successful in fending off the crisis. And of course, government economic policy uh, will go through a very, very big exam very soon. 
if the government continues to support only key industries and key companies run by Mr. Putin's friends, like you know, Rosneft or whatever, uh, it's going to face a lot of social discontent. And here we'll see, unfortunately, not only growing demands for you know, more transparent governance, more democracy, or whatever, more economic uh, uh, um, equity in decision making, but also a demand for a strong hand type of regime a demand for Chinese style measures, uh, which the government will not be able to provide. This government is unable to do a China. It's too corrupt. And this, I think, will be a major uh, political issue in Russia uh, in, the coming, in the coming months and probably years. Well, Kostya, thank you very much for for this. This has been very interesting. Thank you for being with us. And uh, we look forward to welcoming you, hopefully physically, next time soon in Prague or elsewhere. Bye-bye. I hope so. All the best. <laughs>